I'll be brief, I'm hungry too. <laughs> I'm presenting splitting after contractual release for Dupuytren's disease. This is a pragmatic study, which means splitting was evaluated in the context of everyday clinical practice, where variations in surgical practice, hand therapy practice, and whether the patient decides to do what you tell them to do all have to be taken into account. Uh, this means we needed quite a large sample size, so a multi-center uh, technique was used, and it's a randomized <coughs> controlled trial. It was funded by Action Medical Research, which is a charity in the UK. We're based in Norwich, uh, which is 120 miles northeast of London. Uh, we have quite a large hospital in the middle of a very rural area, with a catchment area of uh, half a million people. Our research team consists of Tina Josh Harold, who was a principal investigator and a lecturer in occupational therapy at the University of East Anglia, which is right next door to the hospital. Uh, Professor Lee Shepstone, who's a medical statistician, and Adrian Hoynowski, who's a hand surgeon. We're part of the Norwich Dupuytrens group. We recruited our patients from October 2007 till January 2009, and these patients were all listed for a fasciectomy or a dermafasciectomy at five centres across the east of England. We excluded fasciotomy and anyone who had a contraction in the first uh, web space, mainly because this was difficult to measure. Patients were randomized to receive either hand therapy only or hand therapy and a night splint for six months. A te telephone randomization service was used. Pati patients were randomized after surgery at their first hand therapy ap appointment. Uh, randomization was stratified uh, according to center and surgical procedure. Uh, the surgeons used whatever technique they preferred, uh, and the surgeons were blinded to group allocation at the time of the operation. Hand therapists also used whatever techniques they preferred, although data was collected on the modalities used, the frequency, and the duration. The splint was a static thermoplastic splint on the volar surface of the hand, hand-based, and it was applied at the first hand therapy appointment or removal of sutures approximately five to ten days after the operation. It was to be worn at night only, right from the word go, uh, but we did request that no tension was applied to this, uh, to, to this splint in the first three weeks to allow the wound to heal fully. There were concerns from the therapists and surgeons involved of what to do in case the patients in the no splint group started to develop a contracture. So a standard operating procedure was developed, which meant that the hand therapist took a baseline measurement of range of motion at the first post-operative appointment. If a contracture increased by 15 degrees at the PIP or 20 degrees at the MCP, which is criteria agreed by everyone involved, then a splint would be applied in the no splinting group. We used the disability of the arm, shoulder, and hand as our primary outcome measure, but we also recorded active range of motion of the MCP, PIP, and DIP of all four digits, although the range of motion of only the affected digits were used in the analysis. We also uh, recorded satisfaction and used a split diary to record adherence and we recorded the number of therapy sessions. Assessments were conducted by two research assistants in the patient's home. The baseline assessment was collected before the operation with follow-up assessments occurring at 3, 6 and 12 months after the operation. The sample size was calculated using the minimal, minimally clinically important difference of 15 points of the dash. We used a power of 90% and a significance of 5%. Allowing for a 20% dropout, the estimated total sample required was 128 participants. We exceeded this and uh, recruited 154 participants with a loss of follow-up of only six. So 218 patients were uh, invited to participate in the study, of whom 172 consented. Of this 172, 46 <coughs> were excluded after consent for various reasons. This left 154 to be randomized, which conveniently 77 ended up in each group. Of the 77 allocated to a splint, only 76 received a splint, well, which is quite a lot actually. One decided not to have a splint after his operation because he had full range of motion, although he did agree to participate in the follow-up assessments, but he would be recorded as having a 0% zero, uh, zero adherence. In the patients who were in the no splint group, of the 77, 56 received hand therapy only. 22 ended up receiving a splint. 14 of these received a splint as per our protocol, which meant that they started to develop a contracture beyond our criteria. The remaining eight of the 22 were given a splint as a protocol violation, which meant 
in most cases because a surgeon requested it despite the patient being in the study and has, us having a standard operating procedure. We did account for that. We knew that would happen. <laughs> we used three different analyses to try and gain a total picture of what our results were. Our primary analysis is an attention to treat analysis, which many of you may have heard of. An attention to treat analysis uh, analyzes the patients to the arm in which they were randomized to. So the, they were intended to have a splint, although some of these patients may not have adhered, or they were intended not to have a splint, although some may have ultimately received a splint. This is considered the most appropriate analysis in a pragmatic trial because it reflects what actually happens in clinical practice. Uh, this means we can widely generalize the results, but it may underestimate the effect of the splint. As you can see from our baseline demographics, just eyeballing it, between the splint group and the no splint group, there is very little difference in the two groups for age, sex, occupation, whether they are working or retired, surgery, dermofasciectomy, we didn't have many, you can see, or fasciectomy, operated digits, whether it was one or two digits operated on, and whether the patient had previous surgery or not. Also, there was very little difference of baseline scores between the two groups for initial DASH score, which was 16.4 in the splint group and 15.4 in the no splint group. Their initial total active range of motion, the total active flexion, which is 260 in a normal digit, and uh, total active extension loss, where zero would be full extension, and this is what they started at. I haven't included the three and six month uh, out outcomes because they're identical to the 12 month outcomes, so we only have the 12 months here. And as you can see, between the splint group and the no splint group, there is no statistically significant difference between the two groups for DASH score, for total active flexion, total active extension, and satisfaction. For the intention to treat analysis as well, we looked at the number of therapy sessions, and again, there's no difference between the two groups. Our second analysis is a protocol analysis. Uh, this gives us a little bit more of an indication of what the results are in terms of uh, patients who actually fo followed our protocol. So in the splint group, it only uh, involves patients who were adherent to their splint, which we defined as 50% or more of the time in the first three months. This is a little bit arbitrary, but we had to set a cutoff. It uh, also includes those patients in the non-splint group who received a splint as per our protocol, so they started to develop a contracture. It excludes those who uh, received a splint as a protocol violation. Again, there's no statistically significant difference between, between the groups for DASH score, total active flexion, total active extension, and satisfaction. Uh, just a word about adherence. Uh, in the splint group, of the 77 patients who received a splint, 12 did not meet our ad ad adherence criteria. And in the non-splint group, who subsequently received a splint, which were 22 patients, five of these did not meet the adherence criteria. Our final analysis was the ex what we called the explanatory analysis, and we used quite a strict criteria for this, which means we only analyzed the persons, people who were adherent to a splint, versus the people who received who did not receive a splint. So a true splint versus no splint. Um, what this tells us is that we now have some statistically significant differences, but in favor of the no splint group. Uh, the reason we do caveat this, because the groups are now uh, lower than their 77 original participants. So excluded here are the patients who are not adhering to the splint and excluded here are the patients who went on to receive a splint for whatever reason. So these groups are no longer equal, and we wonder if we can truly compare them. Just to summarize that briefly, in our ITT analysis, there's no difference between the groups. In the per-protocol analysis, there's no difference between the groups. And the explanatory analysis, there is a difference between the groups, but in favor of not splinting for total active extension and uh, patient satisfaction at 12 months. We do have to uh, bear in mind that we didn't have a true uh, splint group versus no splint group. Uh, we had a splint group versus a wait and see group. So we had patients who received a splint if they started to develop a contracture. So what we've concluded from the study is that a policy of wait and see, as opposed to splinting everyone, is equally effective, but perhaps much cheaper. The oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> 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 limitations of our study. <laughs> 
blinding of the patients was not possible, blinding of the researchers was not feasible, and we also have questions about the DASH being used as a primary outcome measure. It's probably where we're heading towards uh, future research, and if anyone is working on outcome measures, I'd be very happy to talk to them. The end. <laughs>